Previously on Hef Mark II's KSP Madness, Bob Kerman ascended to godhood after somehow surviving a crash on Drez at two-thirds the speed of light. Following this, he unleashed his godly powers and rearranged the Kerball system. Yes. Good. We found some nice references along the way, and set out to complete one of KSP's most difficult challenges. The Super Tylo Challenge, aka land on this big lad with 4 G's of gravity and return. Following this, we sought out to design a lander, rejected the brick for being a useless contraption, and in its place rose the sandwich. After a launch and refueling fraught with many blunders of my own making, we are here today to send it off to Tylo's crushing surface. But before we do any of that, allow me to introduce you to the stars of the show. Starting with the mission's pilot and commander, Ned Zerkerman. Or just Ned for short. In true Kerbal fashion, Ned was just an ordinary Kerbal. Working an ordinary Kerbal job with an ordinary Kerbal life of snacks and falling onto his face. Until one fateful day, the KSP grabbed him off the street at random and recruited him into their program. After taking a few exploratory flights, his piloting skills proved to be just about passable, and that's more than good enough for the KSP. He is also a staunch rival of Jebediah Kerman's, with the two's rivalry going back to ever since Jeb went MIA in that one save game and had to briefly be replaced. This has led some to speculate that Jebediah plotted to get rid of him by pressuring the KSP to assign him to this mission. Joining him on this daring mission will be none other than the acclaimed engineer Harry Kerman, avid fixer-upper and two-time winner of the K2 Rover Rally, who despite her name, is no more hairy than the average Kerbal. Why her parents would decide to give her a name like this remains unknown, as do their whereabouts. Nobody has seen or heard from either one of them in more than 20 years. Rumor has it that they built their own rocket and escaped to Leif together to start a new life, free from the embarrassment and regret of naming their child after dead skin cells. As for Harry herself, she... exists. Maybe one day she can make the journey to Leif in search of her parents in order to ask them what the hell they were thinking when they named her. <laughs> Subscribe if you want to see Harry go to Leif in search of her parents who wants to get milk at the store. Together they shall make the treacherous voyage to Tylo's surface and back. And to get them to Tylo to begin with, we have another spacecraft, the Dante Crew Capsule, which gets its name from the fact that this mission is going to be absolute hell. Welcome to Alternus Kerbal, Mission to Tylo, Part 2, Defeating the Juggernaut. However, before we can launch this bad boy, we first have to actually get the sandwich to Tylo and refuel it. Again. Which will require another launch of the now revised, all new, inspired wow. Refuel Module C, which is literally just the Refuel Module B, with a nuclear powered middle stage to get it to Tylo. Anyways, without further ado, let's get the sandwich to Tylo, shall we? But first, let's finish transferring the fuel and wait for the funny orbs to spin around in line properly. And 200 days of staring at the screen later, off we go.
Following this transfer and a quick mid-course correction, the sandwich made it to high low without the tomatoes or lettuce falling out. It made a series of insertion burns to slow down to low orbit. Except we actually fell a bit short, but that's no bother. The fuel module actually carries more fuel than the sandwich can hold, meaning that we can partially refuel it a third time in low orbit. Oh yeah, speaking of refueling, let's launch the all-new, inspired, Refuel Module C. Shall we? Approximately one year later, the refuel module had reached Tylo and began its agonizing series of orbital insertion burns to reach orbit, as its thrust-to-weight ratio is comparable to an obese man trying to use his own farts for propulsion. All in all, it took more than 10 periaptus passes to actually get a favorable orbit for a rendezvous with the sandwich. From here it was yet another soul-crushingly difficult docking to get the fuel into the sandwich's tanks. In fact, this docking was even more difficult than the last, as 1. We had to keep the booster attached to the fuel module, and 2. Tylo's gravity was so great even up at this altitude that it rapidly began to pull the two crafts apart from one another. Like a parent trying to separate their children to keep them from fighting. Sand. But, but, but Tylo, man, we're not here to fight one another. You've gotta understand- No! Me pull stuff apart is funny! In spite of the difficult conditions, using my newfound ability to actually use the RCS controls properly, I got the docking ports closer and closer together until... Gotta be pissing in my After once again using my sheer inability to give up to my advantage, I was able to successfully dock on the third attempt. Again. Anyways, following some incredibly exciting fuel transfers, now that everything was in place for the crew to arrive, it was finally time to do just that. Get the legends Ned and Harry Kerman to Tylo. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. As far as my launches go, this one was pretty tame, and consequently, soon enough we were already well on our way to our doom- I mean, Tylo. After approximately one year of sitting in his command pod seat doing absolutely nothing but staring out into the window into the cold, unforgiving void of space, Ned Zerkerman was rudely awakened into firing up Dante's engines to make the orbital insertion around Tylo. Before they could board the sandwich, however, they would still have to wait for it to be refueled a third time. Which, following another frustrating docking maneuver, it was. With the last of the all-new, inspired, Refuel Module C's fuel being transferred into the sandwich's tanks. Through a claw, mind you, that does not appear to have any fuel pumping capability of its own. I I I'm telling you, it's gotta be more teleportation. Checkmate teleportation deniers. After the fuel had been thoroughly teleported from one craft to another, Ned and Harry Kerman then made their rendezvous with the sandwich and prepared to board its incredibly spacious Luxurious command module, which consists of two command seats strapped together inside a service bay. Glamorous. Ned, however, didn't seem to think so, and the only thing keeping his mind in this mission was how good those three gold stars would look on his mom's fridge. Once the sandwich had received its final toppings, the crew module was then undocked from it and was deorbited, being incinerated by Tylo's atmosphere shortly thereafter. And, before he knew it, it was time for Nedzer to pilot the sandwich all the way down to Tylo's hydraulic press of the surface. With a quick jolt, the engines roared to life, and the descent began.
see. Dad's over here. The sandwich has landed. As the seconds went by, and he began to realize what he'd just done, Nedzer's adrenaline began to turn into pure bliss. Oh yeah, and Harry was there too. In total disbelief, he began to look out at the desolate world that now surrounded him, and, soon enough, he went to get up out of his command seat. So, yeah. The sandwich has landed successfully under what probably has to be the single most difficult landing I've ever done in KSP, hands down. Not to mention that the parachutes hardly helped, either, as where I've landed, the atmospheric pressure is barely even high enough for them to deploy. Before we embark on our surface exploration, though, let's subject Ned and Harry to even more waiting by conducting the on-surface refueling first. Well, that only took a hundred days. Let's get down to the surface to deploy the rover. Nice. Apparently, Kerbal spines are made out of titanium. After gracefully falling onto the surface like a bowling ball onto the floor, <laughs> Harry Kerman then began to set up the rover, which has a new name, the Crumb. After fiddling with a few parts to make it actually possible to drive out from under the sandwich, the duo drove it out to some meters away from the lander, where they planted what has to be one of my proudest flags of all time. Following the nail-biting landing, it was finally time for Ned and Harry to just go for a drive. Do something peaceful. Wow, the surface of Tylo sure is a beautiful place after you get used to the gravity. Yeah, now that we're down here, it really isn't all that bad. <sighs> Never mind. I take it all back. Alright, so much for peaceful. As I mentioned in the last video, Tylo's gravity is so high that wheels break for seemingly no reason at all. It's like one moment, everything will be fine, then the next, BAM! Quadruple wheel failure. <laughs> At least we have floating boulders though, so it's all good. After driving off to the east for a bit and deciding to turn back because there was no way we would be able to get down into the lowlands below, I drove back past the sandwich and began making my way west, where I hoped to be able to find a safe way down somewhere. Believe it or not, driving uphill on this Tyla was actually okay, but driving downhill was a whole nother ball game. As the gravity made the rover accelerate downhill extremely quickly, like one second I'd be doing just fine. Then, after looking away for two seconds, I'd be screaming down a hill at 100 meters per second. Once this happened, there really wasn't any way to stop it other than to just pray, and maybe ride a wall uphill if one was available. Using this technique at lower speeds though, I was able to make it work, and kept going up into the mountains where I met my arch nemesis, Dre- I mean... Polygon Boundaries. So, yeah. The greatest challenge of driving on Tylo came not from uphills or downhills, but from something as simple as terrain polygons. The reason for this, at least I think, is because whenever I drove over one, for a brief moment, the entire weight of the crumb would be bearing down on just one or two wheels, which, under the gravity, caused them to fail. Luckily, I was able to more or less circumvent this problem by just straight up jumping over them most of the time, but they were still quite a nuisance. So much of a nuisance, in fact, that once I actually got to the edge of one of the lowland areas, which I called the Nedzerfjord, I decided to just turn back, as clearly regular rover reels just aren't going to cut it on Tylo. Wow, get a load of this guy. He spends days designing a lander, but gives up on his rover after an hour. What a loser. Anyways, after turning back with the crumb, we began making the treacherous descent downhill, as, guess what? Driving in a straight line to your destination and back is boring. boring. Let's go in a big circle instead. Getting back downhill was, in itself, very difficult, as I constantly had to be on my toes to try to keep myself from just speeding off into oblivion. Also, on a somewhat more nerdy note, look at how fast the atmospheric pressure is increasing due to the low scale height. Wow, amazing! After limping our way to the sandwich due to the repair kits running out, and after Ned and Harry had performed the crew transfer teleportation maneuver, it was finally time to leave this crushing planet behind. 
I then waited for the Dante to be in the right place in its orbit overhead, and... Jettison mining module. Jettison upper lander can. Throttle to full. KSC, this is sandwiched. We are go for launch. Roger that, Ned. Launch when ready. Before I knew it, what was left of the sandwich had made its way back into low tidal orbit, with a pretty narrow delta-v margin to spare, if I do say so myself. And Ned and Harry could actually move again without feeling like they would break every bone in their bodies, so that was nice. Huh? The pair then used their EVA packs to complete the rendezvous with the Dante, and, following a swift ejection burn, we began making our way back home from Tyler. So long, idiot. Finally back in the comfort of an actual space capsule, our brave Kerbnauts settled in for the long ride home. Many days later, following a somewhat unconventional trajectory, Jewel began to appear larger and larger in the capsule's window. Some days later again, Lathan Kerbin became visible as pale blue dots next to it. Soon, the larger of the two, Kerbin, began to fill the view of the window, and, with a loud thud, the service module was jettisoned from the Dante's capsule, which braced for re-entry. And, just mere minutes later, Nedzer and Harry made a gentle splashdown in the ocean, becoming the very first Kerbals to land on Super Tylo and return. The capsule was then recovered, and... That's all she wrote. That was me going to Tylo in the Alternus Kerbal mod, which I highly suggest you give a try, as... I've already had a lot of fun playing around with it, and I'd really be interested in making more videos, you know, pertaining to it if you want to see more of that. Thanks for watching, and see you next time. Yeah, that's right. In your face, Jeb. I'm the first to tie Lowen back. Yes, thank you, Ned. Very cool. But didn't you hear? We've both been assigned to the next mission. The Grand Tour. A Grand Tour? I would need that now. To find... him.